Dr. Freilich has a great bio, so I'm going to read his bio. I can't remember all of this. It's very impressive. Uh, and we're just thrilled to have him once again in Ely to talk about his research in the Quetico Superior ecosystem. Uh, Lee is the director of the University of Minnesota Center for Forest Ecology. He received his PhD in forest ecology from the University of Wisconsin Madison in 1986. Lee teaches courses at, in fire, at forest fire ecology and landscape ecology on the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota and has advised 25 graduate students. Uh, Lee has authored more than 140 publications with 120 co-authors from 15 countries, including major works for Cambridge University Press and Oxford University Press. He is listed among the top 1% of all scientists in the world. His research has been featured in the news media 400 times, including such venues as the New York Times and National Ge Geographic. He has provided consulting services on foreign forest management for many government agencies, including the U.S. Army, the Air Force, the National Forest Service, the National Park Service, and the Department of Natural Resources in several states. His current research interests include fire and wind in boreal forests, old growth hemlock and maple forests, invasive earthworms in forests, deer and mouse browsing, patterns of tree height, and impacts of climate change. So that's a lot of current research. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Lee Freelich to uh, speak to us today. Hey, thanks for inviting me. I don't know whether I can live up to that introduction, but <laughs> I'll try. Um, when I was 12 years old, I decided I was going to be a scientist. And I never envisioned that there would be rooms full of people waiting to hear me speak. Um, but nevertheless, it happened. So, um, and four, four events in two days. But when I was in Washington, D.C., Becky scheduled me for six events in two days. So <laughs> I have to work hard when I'm traveling. That's um, nothing. We do 12. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the boreal forest? So this map here shows the boreal forest looking down on the world from above. And as you can see, most of it's in Russia, Scandinavia, and in Canada. And here in Minnesota, we've got just the southern, very southern edge of the boreal forest. So that makes Minnesota a very special place um, within the 48 states. And you've all seen this view probably of Tetagoosh State Park, so you know all about the the scenery of the boreal forest, the coniferous trees, the spruce, fir, pine, and larch. Oh, lights, lights, lights. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about climate change, so right off the bat here, I'm going to tell you about four of my favorite former scientists who did the... the um, groundbreaking work over the last two centuries. Well, first of all, Fourier discovered that CO2 is a greenhouse gas in the 1820s. Um, Tyndall showed that CO2 actually played a role in climate change in the 1860s. Um, Dr. Seuss, and this is a different Dr. Seuss than you're probably <laughs> thinking. Um, this is Dr. Hans Seuss, and he was an atmospheric physicist and he proved that the excess CO2 in the atmosphere was coming from fossil fuels in the 1950s because it has a different isotopic signature than natural CO2 would have. But then the really big player here is Arrhenius who was a Swedish scientist, uh, lived in the 1800s into the early 1900s and even though he's mostly known for his Nobel Prize where he discovered that salts dissolve and conduct electricity in water. Um, his real interest was climate change and the role of CO2 in climate change. So he did the first calculations and projections for how the climate of the earth would change if we doubled CO2 and published those results in 1896. So he predates Al Gore by, I don't know, eight, eight or nine decades. Um, 
he's the real father of global warming. Um, and I don't know how he did these calculations. They're very complex. It was before computers. Uh, but the one thing I am sure of is that all Swedes are 100 years ahead of the rest of the world. <laughs> Well, you know, all the Scandinavians are, are advanced. Um, so here's a, here's a more recent graph showing the last 10,000 years of climate in the world. And as you can see, four, five, six thousand 6,000 years ago, we were at the peak of the interglacial we're in now. That was the warm period. We've been in a natural cooling period for 5,000 years. And then the red line on the very right there, that's what's happened in the last few decades. So we're now warmer than we were at the mid-Holocene 6,000 years ago. Um, cherry trees don't lie. Uh, these are, this is a record, believe it or not, of cherry tree blooming since the year 850, where they recorded the date at which the cherry trees started to bloom in Kyoto, Japan every year since 850 and they're in court records because it's such an important thing in Kyoto and as you can see at the very far right here the date of blooming has gotten earlier and earlier in just the last few decades in response to a warmer climate. So it is warming. Um, this shows the mean temperature of the world from several thousand weather stations across the globe since 1880 up to 2014, which is the last bar on the right side, which was the record warmest year in that record. We're on track to set the record again this year um, quite easily, I think. And here's the, the mean temperature of the world for 2014. The yellows and oranges were above average locally and the blue was below average. And nor notice there's that nice blue spot there that sits right over us. You know, just a few percent of the world was colder than average last year, even though worldwide it was the warmest year ever recorded. Um, I should mention that that blue spot is not gonna sit in the same place forever. We may be colder than average one year, but some other year we're gonna be much warmer than average. So don't let the fact that we had a cool year fool you into thinking that global warming has come to an end. So where are we going in the future? Um, these are some projections showing early century on the left, mid-century in the middle, and late century on the right side with a high emission scenario in the upper, a low emission scenario in the lower. This is actually in degrees Fahrenheit because Don Wubbles and I made this slide to use in Washington, D.C., and you don't do Celsius <laughs> in Washington, D.C. Um, so we've got the, the dark red here is 15 degrees. So this is June, July, August, mean summer temperature. So looking on the upper right there, we're looking at 12 or 13 degrees warmer summer temperature here for a high emission, which would be business as usual scenario. Uh, with a low emission scenario, if we cut emissions by 75 or 80 percent over the next um, several decades, then we would only warm up about five degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the difference between going from here to about St. Cloud for the low emission scenario versus going from here to about Omaha, Nebraska. So if you wanted to move to Nebraska, don't bother, it, Nebraska's coming here. <coughs> so here's another way to view the changing climate. The, the little brown map of Minnesota there shows what the summer climate would be like with a business as usual scenario by the end of the century. Uh, we think that a climate change of this magnitude will cause everything like trees to shift their range northward by about 300 miles. And we've got a lot of edges here. The trees in the blue boxes there, balsam fir, white spruce, and paper birch are examples of boreal trees and we're near the southern edge of the range. And temperate species like sugar maple, red maple, and oak were right at the northern edge of the range. So Minnesota is the edgiest state um, in the union, almost everything every species in this state reaches the edge of its range here. So we'll be very sensitive to a changing climate because of that. 
And here's one example, balsam fir in the map on the left. Areas in red are high abundance of balsam fir right now. And the projection where we would go by the end of the century for a business as usual, usual scenario on the right. And you don't see anything there. That's because we don't expect any balsam fir to remain in Minnesota for that scenario. And the spruces would respond the same way. White and black spruce, balsam poplar, paper birch would all respond in a very similar fashion. In addition to having higher temperatures, we expect more variation. And that's because the jet stream is starting to do some pretty weird things compared to what it used to do. It used to blow in a so, you know, it blows in a circle around the world and to the north of the jet stream is the polar air mass which is quite cold and the jet stream blows right along the border between that cold air mass and the warmer air masses to the south. Well what's been happening as the climate warms is that the jet stream has started to meander more. The temperature difference from equator to poles is less than it used to be. That makes the jet stream blow more slowly, and any type of river that goes more slowly meanders more. Yeah. That more, but now I'm in front of someone else. Yeah. Move around. Okay. I'll try to do that. So, meandering jet stream means big ridges and big troughs. So, well actually, let me just point on the board. If you're in one of these big ridges, it'll be warm. And these, are, these patterns are sticking for months at a time, so you'll have a warm spell that'll last for months. And if you're in a trough, you'll have a cold spell that lasts for weeks or months. And you might remember 2012 when it was warmer than average for months in a row. Uh, and then last year it was colder than average for months in a row. So we also expect more variability. And here are some of the effects of that. Here's magnolia in bloom on St. Paul campus in March in 2012. You know, I decided in 1988 that global warming <laughs> was real, that there was enough evidence to support it. And, but I never thought I would live long enough to see magnolias bloom in Minnesota in March, but I did anyway. Um, and here you see that spring, the pattern of the jet stream, big trough out west, big ridge here, so California was cold. We were warm, just the opposite of, of the past year where they've been hot and we've been cold. Well, one of the results of that early spring with um, couple weeks of 80 degree weather in March was that the boreal conifers like white spruce came out of dormancy too early and then were frozen later and turned brown as you see there for miles and miles. This is around um, Thunder Bay, Ontario. And they recovered. They've grown new needles, but if we were to get two springs in a row like that, they would be dead, right? Their needles live for five or six years, so we've had three years of recovery now, so they've got three or four years worth of new needles, but two years in a row would wipe them out. So the boreal forest could be wiped out just by having a couple of extremely early springs. And this, the spring of 2012 would be an average spring by the year 2090. But we think we'll get two or three springs like that in a row well in advance of 2090 because of the variability as the climate warms up. It's going to be like the stock market, not a smooth line. So what does all this mean? Well, it was too much work for me, so I got these graduate students. Um, Nick Dons, for example, who is now at the University of Wisconsin-Superior, studied the prairie forest border. Shana Bapaki, who is from um, Madagascar, originally studied sugar maple across the, the region. Roy and Nick there in the lower left um, studied big disturbances and climate change, and Eli Anasco is doing that. He's finishing up a study now on the response of the forest to the big fires and the windstorm fire combinations we've had since 1990. And Dave Chafin uh, in the lower right there had 100 sensors out throughout the Boundary Waters measuring temperatures hourly for two years. 
and we wanted to look at whether north slopes will stay cold enough um, to maintain boreal species in a warm climate. So I'll show you some of their results. So here's the question, maple, spruce, or savanna? And Minnesota has these three biomes. You can see the conifer forest there, um, spruce, fir, boreal forest in the dark green, the temperate forest, which was oak and maple in the light green, and then the original grasslands of the state, uh, which are still grass, but have made a switch from big and little blue stem to corn, still a species of grass, but nevertheless, those were the original grasslands. I call it the corn biome these days. So here's the prairie forest border. You can see the green had, had trees of some sort, and you see that heavy black squiggly line there. That was the original prairie forest border. And what causes that to be where it is? Well, it turns out it's the balance between precipitation and evaporation. If there's more evaporation than precipitation, you have a zero water balance that's shown in the brown and you get grassland. If there's an excess of rainfall over evaporation, you get the greens and blues and you get forest. So we were able to map that out and determine that the prairie forest border location is set by that precipitation and evaporation balance in general, but all the little tiny squiggles at scales of 10 or 20 miles, those are set by topography, sandiness of soil, nearness of lakes and things like that. Here's an example of some changes already happening on the prairie forest border, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And this picture on the right side here is not a, a fall picture or a winter picture, it's midsummer. It's an aspen forest that has died because of the high frequency of droughts in recent years. And it's only a matter of time before this spreads to the prairie forest border in Minnesota. And the question is, will the prairie forest border move enough to hit the boundary waters? And I think it will. If we have the business as usual scenario, it'll shift about 300 miles and that will take it to about Thunder Bay so that the boundary waters would be right at the prairie forest border. That's where that zero balance between precipitation and evaporation would be if the summers warm up by 12 degrees. In addition to that, we'll have higher drought frequencies due to that variation in the jet stream that I showed earlier. Um, Insect outbreaks, you see here a picture of the birch on the North Shore on Highway 61 because we had ten, eight out of 10 years, we had severe droughts, eight out of the last 10 years during the summer. And birch is one of the most sensitive species to drought. Okay, I said we'd cover invasive species too, so I threw earthworms in because they're the master invasive species. We have no native earthworms here. Um, in Minnesota. And the question here, global warming or global worming? And the answer is both. We're getting global warming and we're also getting global worming. And not just here, but worms are invasive everywhere in the world. Uh, they alter the ecosystems, they change the soil structure, and believe it or not, they warm up the soil all by themselves and that will add to the warming caused by a warmer climate. And soil temperatures are perhaps more important to trees than air temperature, so the worms will have a big impact. So they basically eat the organic horizon, otherwise known as duff or leaf litter, that insulates the soil during summer, keeps it cool and moist. That's what worms do for a living, is they eat dead leaves. Um, so they eat that, they compact the mineral soil underneath, that causes drier soils, more rain runs off, there's lower nutrient availabilities. We're getting about 30% reduction in tree growth when the earthworms, the European earthworms invade. They cause drought stress, mortality of plant populations, and many native species of plants like woodland wildflowers are, um, die off when the earthworms invade. And then there are continuing effects on water quality and wildlife habitat and facilitating invasive species of plants, um, like buckthorn and garlic mustard and Europe or Tatarian honeysuckle. Those all are dependent on European earthworms to create the right seedbed conditions for their growth. 
So here's a balsam fir. Doug Wallace took this picture, who is in the audience back there. Uh, balsam fir um, at the, oh boy, which portage was that? Um, Wolf Lake Portage in the Trout Lake unit of the Boundary Waters. And you can see the root system is exposed because the worms have eaten that leaf litter layer. And this is why the soil warms up. That insulation is gone, the tree roots are exposed, they're more sensitive to drought as a result. This is Dave Chafin's latest map of earthworm invasion in the Boundary Waters. So the red areas are heavily invaded. Yellow areas partly invaded and the green areas not invaded. So if you look here, there's some big areas that aren't invaded yet, but the red areas are, and those correspond to campsites, portage trails, and lakes that are accessible to motorboats. So he had 2,000 randomly located plots throughout the Boundary Waters and was able to make a model that allowed him to predict, predict for every 30 by 30 or 100 by 100 foot grid square throughout the Boundary Waters, the probability or which um, stage of invasion it would be in, five being heavily invaded by earthworms. And they will spread from there. So this is a pioneering invasion. In southern Minnesota, they've already spread wall to wall. Now what about um, deer? As the climate warms, we'll get higher deer populations in northern Minnesota. There were very few deer here originally. The climate was too cold. Uh, deer are also regulated by wolves to some extent. So if you have few wolves, you have a lot of deer and the deer eat the trilliums and orchids and you end up with a lot of ferns in the forest. If there are a lot of wolves, there's fewer deer and then the trilliums and orchids will remain. Um, these are called trophic interactions or food web interactions. I happen to have this map of northern Wisconsin. I don't have a map like this for Minnesota, but the red areas are wolf pack territories. And if you look at forests in the middle of those wolf pack territories, they look much different than forests in the spaces between them because of the different deer densities. And you know, deer aren't the smartest thing that ever lived, uh, but they're smart enough not to live in the middle of a wolf pack territory. Uh, <laughs> So they move into those interstitial spaces between the wolf pack territories. So there's actually huge differences in the abundance of deer across the landscape. And some, the, the actual overall deer population is stable or rising. People often think, well, locally their deer disappeared. Well, they just moved somewhere else because the overall population on a statewide level is, is still high. So, but the high densities of deer do move around the landscape. Well, here's some pictures of two cedar forests here, white cedar, and there's one with a low wolf impact, therefore high deer on the left side, and you can see the lack of richness of plant species there and no regeneration of trees because the deer are eating the seedlings of the cedars. On the right is a picture of an area with high wolf density one in the middle of one of those wolf pack territories lots of plants, lots of regeneration of trees, and it shouldn't be a surprise that the forest on the right will be much more resilient to climate change because the, it does not have an overpopulation of deer because it has a high population of wolves. And that's how deer and wolves and climate change are intertwined with each other. So let's look at the transition between spruce and fir, boreal forest, and oak and maple or temperate forest. The area where all those species grow together is shaded in the gray here. And one of my graduate students, um, Nick Fizzichelli, who is now working for the National Park Service out in Fort Collins, Colorado, visited all these sites, the red triangles and the little black stars, a couple hundred sites in all. And every one of these forests had spruce and fir growing next to maple and oak. They were mixed together and he wanted to see what was going on there. Are the maple and oaks invading underneath the canopies of the boreal or spruce and fir forests? Well, if you look on the upper graph here, um, it shows summer temperature from cool 
In other words, if you look on this map here, it's cool summer temperatures up here and warm summer temperatures when you get out near the prairie forest border. So here you've got the cool summer and the warm summer. And the blue lines are the growth of spruce and fir, which grows really well in the cool summer and doesn't grow as well in the warm summer. And then uh, red oak, sugar maple, and, and red maple are the three red lines, and they're growing better when it's warm than when summers are cool. The tipping point is 65 degrees mean summer temperature. If it's warmer than that, maple and oak will outgrow spruce and fir. If it's cooler than that, the spruce and fir will outgrow the maple and oak. Unless you throw in some deer, which don't like to eat spruce and fir, and will only eat the maple and oak, and they reduce the growth rates of the maple and oak and leave the spruce and fir alone, then the balance goes out to 67 degrees. So deer can even interfere with the response of trees to a changing climate um, by changing the growth rates of seedlings that they're eating on the forest floor. So if the summer temperature gets to be above a mean of 65, maple and oak will take over. Of course, temperature does not lie uniformly across the landscape. North-facing hills are cooler than south-facing hills, for example, and so there will be a mosaic of responses across the landscape um, as the climate warms. So spruce and fir will disappear from some spots sooner than others. So here's a picture of an area that's got some temperate forest maple there in the yellow and orange next to some boreal forest in northern Minnesota. And what Nick Fisichelli's data shows overall for the entire region is that the temperate tree species are invading the boreal forests on a local and regional scale. Uh, the temperatures have warmed up enough to allow maple and oak to invade boreal forest, but not enough to kill the boreal trees. So the area where the temperate and boreal are mixed together has gotten broader. The ecotone, or where the two biomes mix together, is getting wider at this point. So boreal forest can be kept free of maple and oak by extreme winter cold, like minus 42 degrees Celsius would kill a maple or oak, because they can deep super cool their sap down to that temperature. That's about minus 44 Fahrenheit. Um, this is a, a satellite image that was taken on one of the cold winter nights in the winter of 2014, February 11th here. And the dark gold, greenish gold colors are minus 30 to minus 40. Uh, and the, the, the whites are only zero to minus five or so. Here you see the heat island of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's minus six there minus 27 at St. Cloud and minus 32 at Ely. Learn to love red maple. There's gonna be a lot of it in your future. And here is a forest in fall, a boreal forest, and you can see the young red maples underneath that have turned color there. So they are invading. And what better way to convert that instantly from boreal to temperate forest than to have a big windstorm come along and cut off the canopy of the boreal trees and release all those red maples. Um, there's a big variation in frequency of high windstorms from the Twin Cities there, 21 and 22 years of derecho, which is a strong straight line wind. Only three out of 22 years observed up here in northern Minnesota. Well, what if that wind frequency from the Twin Cities just shifts up here as a result of climate change? We could knock down all the forest here and release all those red maples in the understory within just a couple decades. Now, we get hurricane force winds every summer in Minneapolis. We just had that last week. Uh, so twice last week, yeah. And it doesn't happen up here very often, but if it does happen in the future, it can convert those forests much more rapidly. And again, what happens is the boreal species would be knocked over and the seedlings of the temperate species would be underneath to take over. So we've got lots of things that affect um, trees, longer droughts in a, in a changing climate, the earthworms, the deer, more fires, more windstorms, and pests and diseases. I should have pointed out that emerald ash borer is killed at minus 30 Fahrenheit. So your ash trees up here are pretty safe 
until the winters warm up enough that it doesn't hit minus 30. Well, in the winter of 2013, 2014, we were hoping it would hit minus 30 in Minneapolis, and it didn't. We could only squeak out minus 23. The coldest winter in 30 years in Minneapolis, and all we could get was minus 23. So that tells you something about how much the winters have warmed up. So emerald ash borer was not wiped out in the Twin Cities. It could not survive here, but who knows in a couple decades. So all these things are working against trees. Um, this is a, a biome map that shows hot, wet places here. In other words, tropical rainforest, um, hot deserts here, and tundra up at the top. And Minnesota is right there. We've got boreal forest, we've got temperate deciduous forest here in grassland. We've got all three biomes. And what will happen with a warmer climate is we'll go like that, the boreal will be gone, we'll just have grassland and temperate forest. So this is what forests up here look like today. There's Voyagers National Park. We have lynx, we have moose, we have wolves. Actually, wolves won't be affected much by a warming climate. Lynx probably will and moose will. Um, so we've got these species of trees being replaced by these species. How about bur oak, hackberry, American basswood, bitternut hickory, Kentucky coffee tree, and I know that you all instantly when you saw this recognized rock elm, American elm, and red elm as our three native elms in Minnesota. These are all species of trees that would grow well in a much warmer climate. So where is a future analog for the boundary waters? If you look at a place that right now has the climate we expect in the future, you come down here and I've got two analogs here, um, one with good soil, which is the orange star, the Candy Ojai Elm Forest, and one for shallow rocky soil, which is the nice outcrops natural area with the blue star. Here's the Candy Ojai Elm Forest, still beautiful, right? But it's not like the forest you have here now. And here are some maple, historic maple forests, which are sugar maple forests, which we, we have historically had in central and southern Minnesota. Trilliums in the spring, white snake root there in the upper left in the, in the summer. Well, because of the worms and the deer, even those forests will not look like they do now in the future. If they move into the boundary waters, they'll look more like this. There will not be trilliums, there will be Pennsylvania sedge, which forms that lawn in the forest, because that species does well with high deer populations and earthworms, and trilliums don't. And here's the other analog. This is a good analog for the future of the Boundary Waters, nice outcrops, natural area, rocky, igneous rock, shallow to bedrock, much warmer climate than the Boundary Waters, and you basically have got juniper and bonsai burr oak growing in the crevices along with little blue stem and two species of prickly pear cactus. Two of the three native cactus species in Minnesota are found at nice outcrops natural area. So it's still beautiful, uh, but really not the same as the Boundary Waters today, which is this. Very nice picture one of my graduate students took. But how about going from this to this? You know, so this is Burr Oak savanna on a sandy soil at um, Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve. And again, very beautiful. I mean, you could throw a giraffe in here and you'd think you were in Africa. <laughs> um, these little Burr Oak trees like that are 200 years old. Um, so very unique, still very beautiful, still worthwhile, but not the same as the Boundary Waters today. But this is what I predict will happen on the shallow rocky soils if we warm up the summers by 10 or 12 degrees. What about our, our bogs with the black spruce and the moss? Well, if you look in the paleoecological record, there were black spruce bogs in Indiana 
at the peak of the glaciation when climates were much colder than they are and what happened to them as the climate warmed as they turned into red maple swamps. So red maple um, and burr oak and species like that should do very well here in the future. So just to summarize, red maple now and other hardwoods later on moving in, oak savanna on shallow soils, we're likely to lose our boreal biome, which is a third of all our native species. Plants, animals, birds, insects, fungi, whatever, it's a third of our native species. And this slide, which I made for Amy Klobuchar, um, she called one day and said, I'm giving a speech on the floor of the Senate tomorrow. Can you give me some slides? And of course, for a senator, you can drop everything immediately, right? So, so I made this slide for her. And so links in a warmer climate would be replaced by bobcat, moose replaced by deer, and blackback woodpecker replaced by red belly. Um, this is the sort of thing I figured they would be able to understand in Washington. <laughs> Um, you know, graphs and maps and those sorts of things, maybe not, so. Well, it, it makes the point. And here is another summary. So plants are going to be affected from below by the invasive earthworms and above ground they're going to be affected by the deer. They're going to be affected by temperature both above and below ground because soil temperatures are really important. Hills are going to, topography is going to be really important um, in the boundary waters because it, it really is fairly hilly. You only need a 50 or 100 foot hill to create differences in temperature. And with that, acknowledgments of people who have ever donated money and all the programs like National Park Service and National Science Foundation, Forest Service, um, the Environment Trust Fund. Right? Some of your lottery money goes to research at the university, so you should all play the lottery. Um, and people like Bruce and Ruth Dayton and John and Charlotte Parrish have donated money over the years to my program. So thanks to all of them. And do you have any questions for the four of us here? Do we have time for questions? We have time? Yeah, we have okay. lots of time. Yeah. All right. Lots of questions. We'll fire away with questions. Yes. Yeah, the question is what about um, moisture and precipitation predictions? Well, we expect annual precipitation to go up maybe 10 or 15 percent, but that would be mostly in the winter, and summer precipitation would go down slightly. And so having a warmer summer with less rainfall will be the bottleneck for trees getting through those warm, dry summers. And that's, that's why we're saying the winter climate's going to be like southern Wisconsin, but the summer climate's going to be like Nebraska or Kansas. And it's really the summer climate that matters the most to trees. You know, once, you, once you're free to that minus 44 degree limitation on maple and oak, what really matters is the summer temperature, because there are a lot more limitations in summer than winter. Okay, the question is, what other changes? Well, the wildlife I already showed, when you change vegetation, you change wildlife. All wildlife species either eat plants or live in plants as their habitat, right? So, um, except for some things that live in volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean, which doesn't apply to Ely. Uh, so, other changes, what about oxygen? Well, Boreal forest does produce a fair amount of oxygen, but there'll be new boreal forest moving north onto the tundra. A lot of our oxygen comes from tropical forests, and a lot of it comes from algae in the ocean. So I don't expect our oxygen content will change. Um, the wood products industry will obviously change a lot. They'll have different types of materials to work with, and it's not just here, but everywhere in the world biomes are going to shift to different locations. So there'll be a lot of economic implications, uh, a lot of bottlenecks for endangered species that are in very small habitats and may not be able to move in order to respond to climate change. So we expect a big wave of extinctions. Yeah, and I could go on and on all day with that question, but 
Yeah. What about lake levels? Okay. Well, lake levels will vary a lot depending on the configuration of the basin of each lake. But certain lakes will dry up and disappear. I mean, I talked to a limnologist, a really well-known limnologist, who expects that with the business-as-usual scenario, we would lose 40% of all our lakes in Minnesota. They would either become marshes or they would dry up completely. But other lakes that have good inflow and they have, you know, like a rocky outlet that controls the level would continue to be the lakes, and that would be true for a lot of the lakes in the Boundary Waters. So I don't think we'd lose a lot of the lakes in the Boundary Waters, um, but in the central part of the state, the pothole region, we would probably, a lot of those would probably dry up. A lot of variable effects from region to region and from lake to lake. One lake, two lakes right next to each other could have a completely different response depending on their, their basin. Yeah, the question is about tree pollen, which I happen to be allergic to every species of tree. So, um, and I have noticed that, that pollen is coming earlier in the spring here in Minnesota and causing more severe symptoms in terms of, of runny nose and itchy eyes and so on. So yeah, um, the pollen seasons will last longer. And they'll come earlier. And there's some species of trees that don't care about temperature. They're regulated by day length. So some species will put their pollen out earlier and some will stay the same. So the season with high pollen concentrations will get longer. So, and with warmer air, yeah, you're, you're right. Certain pollutants will stay in the air longer. So it'll be bad for people with allergies and asthma. And I think that'll be quite widespread. There are certain species of weeds that grow extremely well with enhanced CO2, like ragweed, for example, which a lot of people are allergic to. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. There, there have been whole studies of species that grow better in enhanced CO2. That includes poison ivy. Just having a higher CO2 concentration, even if you don't change the temperature, will make poison ivy grow better. And most vines in general and things like Canada thistle and ragweed. There are a whole bunch of species that will grow better just because of more CO2. And if you make it warmer and more CO2, they'll do really, really well. Well, the magnitude will, I mean, these effects will occur. It's just a matter of the magnitude. With business as usual, the magnitude of the effects will be bigger than with reduction in CO2. What are the odds of our species, you know, actually, let's say, achieving the 80% reduction in emissions? Well, I don't think the, you know, I'm not a sociologist, but I don't think the odds are very good because if you look at the history of people, they tend to, to um, destroy their environment and move on over and over. That's the pattern that people have had for thousands of years. So, so the, the question is about bringing in new species, and that's called assisted migration if you actually move a species in. It's very controversial because there are always people who think you're gonna screw everything up. Um, my response to that is people with, who live in southern Minnesota and have summer homes in northern Minnesota have been doing assisted migration on a massive scale for decades. And they've brought all sorts of species up here from down south, um, but maybe we should have some better organized, systematic, experiments designed by scientists to see what does well and in fact some of those experiments are underway. Uh, they're, they're looking at ponderosa pine for example on the Chippewa National Forest and they're not going to go out and plant it everywhere. They're going to plant a few plots of it, see how it does. I think it'll do well because we've got ponderosa pine in the Twin Cities. People have been planting it as an ornamental for decades. Um, and there are lots of species of savanna plants that are stuck on tiny little preserves in southern Minnesota surrounded by an ocean of corn. They will not be able to migrate to northern Minnesota. We're going to have to think very seriously about whether to move them up here in order to keep them from going extinct. Um, red maple's doing its thing all by itself. 
bur oak and red oak and basswood, actually and ironwood are also spreading quite rapidly in northern Minnesota. They don't seem to need help. They seem to be making the adjustment all by themselves. So if I was a forester here, I would be looking for those species of trees that I'm right near the northern edge of the range and are they starting to increase? And if so, I would encourage that. What changes in public policy have been made around the world? Well, the Obama administration has the new rules on carbon emissions, which if they actually are effective would be a good thing. It would not stop climate change, but it would slow the rate and it, the magnitude would end up being less. Uh, there are a number of countries around the world that are doing that, but of course the developing countries are putting out huge amounts of CO2. So that's probably where the big wild card is in terms of whether we end up with five or six hundred parts per million CO2 in the future or a thousand. Now if we end up with a thousand parts per million CO2, then the Boundary Waters is going to be an oak savanna, no question about it. If we limit emissions and end up with 500 parts per million CO2, then we could have maybe patches of boreal forest and patches of temperate and patches of grassland kind of mixed together. It's all a matter of the magnitude. But as I said earlier, I'm not all that optimistic that as a global society will succeed in reducing CO2 emissions a lot. Yeah, the, the question is about earthworms and what harm are they causing that we can document. Well, it's, it's one to two degrees warming of the soil. It's 30 to 40 percent greater density of soil. In other words, 30 to 40 percent compaction. And that's because they're displacing native species that drill more holes in the soil than the worms do. So even though worms drill holes in the soil, there are fewer of them after they invade than there were before, so the soil is less spongy. And that causes runoff and that causes so less rain soaks in and that causes the reduction in tree growth that we've documented of 30 percent and that reduction we have been able to prove is caused by drought stress. So you can have side by side one forest plot with worms and one without and we've got several locations like that. Same age of the trees, same species, same soil underneath and with the worms they have 30 percent less growth due to drought stress. The worms also directly make a number of plant species go extinct, especially lilies, things in the lily family like trilliums and orchid species. Yeah, and they affect birds. Oven birds have far fewer nests in areas with earthworm invasion than areas without. And where did they come from? Well, it turns out there are native earthworms in a lot of places in the world, but each earthworm species does something unique to the soil. So even if you already have worms and you bring in worms from another place, they do something different to the soil than the native worms. So we're getting big earthworm impacts all around the world as a result of moving earthworms everywhere. I mean, in the Amazon, in Europe, in North America, in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, they have 12 native earthworm species, and they're getting the same big effects of the soil warming and the soil compaction that we're getting here, even though they've got some native worms, because the new worms are doing different things to the soil. Yeah. Why do we have the big change in the circulation of the, the um, basically the polar jet stream? Why does it go from a circle to big meanders? Is that the question? That's because the pole, the North Pole is warming up much faster than the equator. So the temperature difference from the equator to the poles is what drives the speed of the jet stream. The bigger that difference, the faster it blows. So if the poles warm up more than the equator, that temperature difference is less. The jet stream blows more slowly and that lets it meander more just like slowly flowing rivers meander and rapidly flowing ones don't meander as much. Yeah. White pine blueberries and bears, is that the question? Okay. Um, with a moderate degree of warming, white pine would do very well in the Boundary Waters because we're actually close to the northern edge of its range, so warming up a little bit would benefit it. But if we go all the way to a savanna climate, then it might be relegated to north slopes in the future. If we had the, the moderate warming scenario instead of the business as usual, probably white pine would continue to grow throughout the Boundary Waters and do better than it does today.
Blueberries, no problem, um, as long as there's some shade um, and fires, there'll be plenty of fires in a warmer future, they'll do well. And bears should do better in northern Minnesota because you'll have more oak trees and acorns are one of their major food sources. So I would predict that they would do better in a warmer climate because oak trees would be more abundant. When will we reach the 10 to 12 degree warming if we have the business as usual scenario? Uh, between 2080 and 2100. So seven decades from now. Yeah, well peatlands, there's a big research project underway on the Chippewa National Forest called Spruce and it's like something like a $50 million grant. And they actually have areas of peatland that they have bubbles over and they're heating them up to different degrees. We'll learn a lot in a few years when that experiment gets some results. I mean, it's just getting underway right now. But if you look in the paleoecological record, black spruce peatlands in Indiana turned from spruce to tamarack and then from tamarack to red maple, you know, with sedges instead of sphagnum moss. Um, so I would expect that to happen to some of our peatlands here as well. And I can't wait for the results from the spruce experiment because that, you know, there might be some surprises. But we do know there were peatlands in Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana, and they did decompose and they did go from black spruce to red maple. So, so if that happened in the past, it will happen in some peatlands in the future. And the, the question is, is there a sense of urgency? And not really. Um, <laughs> but, Thanks for the hope, anyway. <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, we do have several members of our delegation that are pretty good on the issue, you know, and our two senators among them, and the, um, Betty McCollum and Keith Ellison um, among them that are pretty good on the climate change issue. Um, but it's, you know, it's, I'm not sure if it's ever going to be at the top of the list, you know, like some of the social issues like economy and so on. Ultimately, of course, climate change could do in the economy to a large extent. You know, all it would take would be to have a, a drought like they had in 2010 in Russia, or this, one of these huge droughts to happen in two of the world's food growing areas in one summer instead of just in one, and we'd be into food shortages worldwide and hyperinflation and so on. Or the other scenario I can think of is Maybe 10 or 20 years from now, real estate agents will figure out that all the most valuable land in the world is worthless. In other words, all of the ocean coast, because it's all gonna be underwater, will go from being the most valuable land to absolutely worthless, and that might cause a huge recession. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Miami isn't gonna be there in the future because I just read a paper that was just published in Science that shows that at the CO2 level we're at today, if we don't emit one more molecule of CO2 to the atmosphere, we're still looking at six to nine meters of sea level rise, which is 20 to 30 feet. So Miami is gonna be gone. Even if we stopped all fossil fuel burning today, Miami would still be gone. And New York City and Stockholm and London and and that will cause some problems for the economy. <laughs> well, that's a little bit shorter time frame because the melting of ice caps is slower than the rate of, of temperature rise. You know, we're talking about a few centuries there rather than several decades just because of the slowness of the melting of the ice caps. Yeah, so to go to a steady state economy, it's something that eventually has to happen, right? Because the world doesn't have an infinite capacity. The question is whether global climate change will cause that to happen or a big war will cause it to happen or whether we'll run until the population of the world is too big and there, we can't feed the people and that will cause it to happen. Something will cause it to happen eventually. Yeah, what's the chance we'll use geoengineering? We won't do anything about emissions and then it'll become <laughs> urgent and we'll suddenly we'll try to engineer the earth and probably overdo it and cause a catastrophe in the opposite direction. <laughs>
I, you know, that's as reasonable a scenario as any other. And I can't predict whether that will happen, but it's just as reasonable as all the other scenarios I've mentioned. Not predictable. As individuals, you should cut your own carbon emissions so you're doing your part. And you should be writing letters to your legislators and, and senators to, to kind of raise the level of urgency in their view. Those are two things that are fairly easy to do. Every time you talk to them, make sure you make that point. We, on that happy note, um, and <laughs> sense of hope, a little yeah. sense of hope, thank you so much, but don't run away. <laughs> um, <laughs>